right, welcome everybody. So it looks like we have a smaller group than normal, but that's okay. Uh, we're going to um, look at the second game I had prepared for the lecture on Magnus, who was mentioned before, I believe is far and away at this point, the best player who's ever lived. At this point, there's two kinds of tournaments in the world. One where Magnus is off form, where he's basically the best player in the world, or one of them, and fighting for first place, and one where he's on form, where it's not even remotely close and just looks like a complete blowout of superior being versus inferior beings. Um, we're going to look at one such game uh, here where Magnus was on form and uh, showing what he's capable of. So uh, first, what we had seen from him was extremely good understanding of how to defend, understanding which piece exchanges to make, combining that understanding with an ability to find only moves every time it was necessary, and saving in position that to my eyes looked absolutely unsavable. Uh, but in order to become the best player who's ever lived, there's more to it than saving bad positions. You have to win as well. And this was a game he played against Li Chao, the Qatar Masters Open in 2015. And a lot of the time, especially nowadays, when you get guys who are at the absolute top of the world and they play guys who are like mid-2700s, like when I played in Mike Anze, for example, they're just not particularly effective at taking out the trash, so to speak. And... Um, and uh, I just don't think they've really shown superiority particularly effectively. And well, except for Magnus in this one. Anyhow, uh, this game starts off as a Grunfeld or sort of a Grunfeld. Magnus chose to play F3. And um, which, uh, yeah, guys, okay, 2750 is trash. I was making a joke at the expense of players like myself or Lee Chow, who are like, you know, sort of lower end super GMs who are not really close to the top, but. Still pretty strong. Anyhow, um, so uh, F3 sort of is the Samish variation, and nowadays um, nowadays people are often going bishop g7 and going into some king's Indian, but d5 has been played a bit. Uh, and honestly, I don't think the state of theory is so bad for black here. So it starts off normally. Um, okay, so who knows what the two main moves are here. Rio, that is one. Anyone else? F5 is not really a move here, as far as I'm aware. Could probably play it, but I don't think it will have independent value. Everyone's got knight c6, that's one. But what's the other main move? It was played by Boris Gelfand, for example, against Vichy in the World Championship match. Nobody else knows the other move here. It's not an opening class, so... Okay, so the other move here is e5. Uh, knight c6 is the one that was played in this game, but e5 is also possible, and there is some variation that goes d5 and c6, and it gets interesting. But um, I don't want to focus too much on that. For now, we'll stick with knight c6. White castle is long. And who knows what the main move is here? I'm saying f5. Um, F5 is the move that was played in this game, but it is not the main move. Um, if you saw this game before, unless you've studied it in detail, I don't particularly care. You won't have understood enough of it that you'll find it useless. I mean, I didn't even understand this game that well until I checked it more recently. All right, so the main move here is queen d6. Um, the whole premise of White's play against the Grunfelds is what he wants to do is not touch his center pawns. In general, as soon as he does, he makes it very easy for Black to attack the center. So basically here, White really wants to leave this pawn on d4. The second he pushes it to d5, Black will be able to attack the pawn with either c6 or e6. And oftentimes the pawn will eventually have to go to d5, but... Uh, you're going to force Black to lose some time. All right, guys, if you've seen this game before, look, if you want to leave, you can leave, but I'm telling you there will be something useful to see. Um, so uh, here, the whole point for Black with Queen d6 is to try to convince White's pawn to go to d5 and uh, and then to follow up. So when he's ready to play Rook d8 next, uh, d5 will then later come, and once d5 is forced, black will be able to break down the center with c6 or e6. There are some complicated variations, but 
That's how it works. In any case, in this game, Lee Shao played f5. And um, white goes e5, and this is a pretty well-known position. Uh, black went knight b4, aiming to fight for the d5 square. And now Carlson played knight h3. And the main move here by far is bishop e6. This was played against me by Lubomir Fatoshnik, for example. Uh, and there's it was recommended by Boris Averick in his um, in his book on uh, the Grunfeld for quality chess. It's a pretty sensible move. But Lee Chow came up with a different idea and played queen e8. At the time of the game, this was a novelty. So Magnus likely did not know this move in advance or anything. Austin is saying, what's wrong with knight d5? Which knight do you want to put on d5? Um, knight 4, d5. Uh, I don't know if anything is wrong with it per se, but it feels like it's not best. Essentially here, I think the best way of understanding this position is it's all about this diagonal. Whoever gets this diagonal tends to be much better. Like if white can like land his bishop on c4, he tends to be in very good shape. So for example, if black were to play knight d5 and we took it here, I think black has to take with the queen. Because if he takes with the knight, then bishop c4 comes. And if white is able to take over this diagonal, he's almost always in very good shape. Um, knight d5, I don't really see what the knight actually does there. It seems like it blocks off a lot of black's pieces. And uh, I think the knight is quite fine on b4 as is. So the main move is bishop e6, and there is now some line after king b1, and white's whole plan now is to play knight f4, gain a tempo on that bishop, and start throwing h4, h5. I managed to execute this plan pretty nicely in a game with Fatochnik, for example, and, um, well, it's interesting stuff, but uh, it, you can sort of see that this knight f4 is the main idea. Instead, Li Chao plays queen e8. So what is Li Chao's big point? Why did he make this move? This is the first step in understanding uh, this position. What's coming next? Why was queen e8 played? Okay, look, a lot of people are saying, oh, this game was in some place that they've seen it, but absolutely nobody has told me a good reason why Queen E8 was played. So, like, just because you've seen it before doesn't mean you know everything about it. Trust me, if it was as easy to look at one Magnus game and then be able to play like him, the world would be a lot better. Um, yeah, so Troy's got this right. Troy, do you want to share with us what the big point is? All right, so let me ask you to unmute. All right, so temporary prevents knight f4 due to g5 and h5 is defended, so yes. knight h5 cannot be played. Exactly right. This is prophylaxis against white's knight coming to the ideal f4 square. What I would very much like to bring his knight here and start throwing h4, h5. The problem is now g5 will come, and we have this square under control. Uh, there's, I'm not even sure you have to play g5 right here. It's probably the best move, but Basically, you're going to do this before white can play h4. You're ready to potentially play f4 next, get the f5 square for your bishop, and you're in very good shape. So we're in this spot where white's whole plan of playing knight f4 followed by h4 is much harder to pull off, which means that white now needs another plan. And coming up with the right plan here is incredibly difficult, uh, but we need, it's, what, it's what Magnus, Magnus managed to do. Um, People make fun of the way I pronounce his name. I'm trying to do it like a Norwegian, but I guess I'm doing it wrong. Um, so I'll just do it like an American, Magnus. Anyhow, uh, I'm not looking for a move, guys. I'm looking for a plan. What are we going to do to try to cause black as much problems as we can? Radia is saying G3, then knight f4, h4, h5. That is interesting. Brian, you're telling me King B1. That that's not a plan. That's a move. You don't. You're not telling me why you want to make this move, what it's accomplishing, or anything like that. Attack somehow. That's extremely um, specific.
Okay, so Brian's sort of closer now. All right, Brian, you want to share what the best move is and why? Okay, let me find him in the... Uh... There you are. That's time yet. Hi. Hey, right. I, would, I would play king b1 because basically we can't go knight f4 now. So, um, and, uh, so, so, so we can try to wait for black to play bishop e6 because then we can play knight f4 if there's no g5. And then we can play h4. The king b1 is the best move because it overprotects the a2 pawn. Yeah. It basically means that now our whole plan is to play knight f4 followed by h4. We are unable to do this as long as black's bishop is sitting on c8, but as soon as it comes to e6, this will be possible. If we did g3 or something like somebody was advocating, and let's say black were to play bishop e6, now you are not able to get your knight to f4 in time because uh, the a2 pawn is hanging. Following something like king b1, this is the kind of position where I'm starting to get very worried about queen f7, knight a4, or something like this. And I believe that this will come before knight f4 is possible. So while black is playing prophylaxis with queen e8, trying to stop you from playing knight f4, in kind, white is also playing prophylaxis with king b1, preventing black from getting his bishop to e6. Now we end up in this sort of little waiting game where... Let's say after a5, as Li Chao played, it's not so obvious for either side how they want to further improve their position. Because what White really wants to do is play knight f4 and throw h4. He cannot do that because g5 will come. But what Black really wants to do is play bishop e6. And he cannot do that because then knight f4 will come. Uh, so here, uh, Anish has a very interesting point. He says, go a3, but not because you want to take on b4. So Anish, why do you want to play a3 then? Got a knight a2. I don't think that makes very much sense. I actually don't know. It seems intuitive. Okay, well, let's work on knowing. Austin says it prevents a4 to a3 from black, but I don't think that's particularly clever because if you wait for black to play a4 yourself, and then you can play a3 and he will actually have to move the knight. When here after a3, he would rather leave the knight as is. He's not particularly scared of you taking it. So I don't think we're really scared of uh, black playing a4. This is a, the next two moves are what really showed what Magnus can do. Imagine white plays a3. What's black going to play in response? Yes, Anish has this right. Anish, you want to share with us the drawback of playing a3? Find you. All right, yeah, let's see. No participants. There we go. Anish. It weakens the B three square. Yes. And all the yes. white and all the white squares. Yeah. But specifically the B three square, this is the big deal. Bishop e6 comes. And the real problem is if we consider playing bishop e6 in a position like this one and knight f4 comes, not only is white getting knight f4 and ready to play h4 next, this bishop doesn't really have a great square. You know, the computer wants to go to c4, which does not strike me as particularly impressive. White might be able to just do something like take it and play queen e2, let's say. And you cannot play queen c6 because of d5. And this position all of a sudden looks horrible with the knight landing on e6 next. You have no counterplay whatsoever along this diagonal, and I think black is in very or white is in very good shape. Um, 
So one big problem with knight f4 is not only that the knight gets here, this bishop just generally doesn't have a square. If you compare this to, for example, bishop e6 in this main position after king b1, normally what black does here is he plays something like queen d7, and after knight f4, he just lets the bishop get taken, uh, which is not thrilling for black, but it's sort of understandable. When we consider the position following queen e8, king b1, and say bishop e6, knight f4, sort of sucks for black. He doesn't really have a great place for this bishop to go. Uh, if he has to play something like queen b7, he's going to get a main line down a tempo because white got king b1 for free. But as once a5 is played, as soon as we play a3, this move bishop e6 becomes much more appealing for a few reasons. But the main one is that this b3 square has become available. Now, I don't know how much white really even cares about that rook, but let's suppose he does and he plays a move like rook c1 and then black goes g5. And he got g5 in before white could play h4, specifically because he had to burn a tempo on this rook. In the meantime, there's bishop c2 in the air. There's knight a4 in the air. There's queen f7 in the air. There's just way too many threats right here. So I really dislike playing a3 in this position because it specifically allows black to get his bishop to e6 and then land on b3. In general, I think a3 would be a very useful move to make. Here, if black just sits and does nothing, if he doesn't stop it. At some point, you may want to take this knight. When the bishop is on e6, that's going to be a much less feasible option because black's attack is going to be a lot stronger. But at some point, this knight might fall. In any case, uh, we can sort of see the drawback of playing a3 here, but we understand that a3... Um... Okay, so Austin is saying, why is g5 f4 bad for white? So let's take a position like here. Let's say this was bishop e6, knight f4, bishop b3, rook c1, and g5. Some position like this one. Is that okay with you, Austin? Yeah, so here, first things first, this knight has to go to h3 because knight c4 is in the air. I don't think you can get away with going to d3. So computer seems to think you can. But like from a human point of view, it feels insane to allow knight c4. Uh, let's say you go knight h3 and we go f4. Here, you're not able to uh, really get very much counterplay. This bishop comes back. First of all, queen g6, check knight c2, already is winning an exchange on the spot and getting the queen into the position to the point that I think you're going to have to trade queens. Um, let's say check. I mean, but even if black just, I don't know, c5, like, blow up the position, get the bishop to e5, if, I don't think white can make a single active move and... If dc5, some rook to d8, this looks really bad. Um, so I really dislike allowing this. I mean, I think if we're going to do this, you probably should play h4 and give an exchange, which I don't know is interesting and unclear, but obviously, I mean, let's say here we go h4 and then queen f7 and black doesn't even take it. And black is ready for moves like knight a4 and then loose in the a2 square. This is, um, this is really dangerous. So... Um, Anyhow, uh, I, I just I think a3 is a good idea, and this is the wrong moment for it. What we need to do is realize that once we play a3, black will very likely want to respond with bishop e6. So once bishop e6 comes, then knight f4, h4, h5 is coming. But the problem is here, I think that black's attack is probably just as fast as white's. I mean, it already seems like if rook c1, g5 is bad news. If h4, at the bare minimum, you're losing material, and you probably and you could have even issues on the c2 square. Um, like I could easily imagine something like, what was this H4? And if black's ready to go like Bishop C2, Queen B3, Knight A4, you can get made in like three more moves. So I find this very dangerous. What we would like to do is play A3, knowing that black wants to meet A3 with Bishop E6 to make sure that you cannot take the Knight. But we need to find the right preparatory moves and the right preparatory setup to make that happen. So what should white play and why? So Ignatius has a good move. Austin is saying king a1. That's similar to what Magnus ended up playing, but the problem is that then when you have whenever you play a3, black really is not going to care about that knight. So king c1, the last move was king b1, so I dislike that. All right, so Austin, you have to 
You have an exclamation mark. Does that mean you want to share your idea? Okay. Right, so I noticed that when this bishop is coming to b3, it's attacking to the, the rook on d1, which is the reason why white can't play h4. But if we, maybe if we move the rook first, then after that, in that line, bishop e6 coming to b3, because it's not attacking the rook, then you have time to play h4. Yes, additionally, that stops bishop c2, which might be even scarier. For example, if we play a3, bishop e6, we were discussing this position here. Honestly, I'd probably be more scared of bishop c2, queen b3 than I would be of this rook hanging. In either case, uh, we really are pretty unhappy that this is coming. So I very much like the move rook c1. That's not what Magnus played. He played it the next move. Uh, but let's suppose he did play rook c1 here. Hang on, this was a5. Let's suppose he did play rook c1, which I don't believe he played here. And then black were to play c6. Uh, now we need another move. And this one, I think, is also very tough. Here, we're potentially ready to play a3, and we're not as scared of bishop e6. If we go something like a3, bishop e6, knight f4, bishop b3, without the possibility of bishop c2, and with the c6 pawn getting in the way of any knight a4 business, uh, I think white's attack should be faster here. And it looks, I think this looks very promising. But if we were to play a3 here, what's black going to respond with? Again, highlighting the weakness of the b3 square. Yes, Arad, yeah. Some people are getting this. Queen f7. Now, when black plays queen f7, it allows white to fix the problem of this knight on f4, or on h3, excuse me, without uh, with a gain of tempo before black can do something. It feels very natural for white to play knight g5. And then queen b3. For example, had black played a move like queen f7 in this position, you can play knight g5, the queen is forced right back where she came from, and we get h4 through. And this is going to be bad news for black. He's in horrible shape. So um, that's not going to work. But as soon as we play a3, we have to realize that this queen could land on b3 the same as a bishop could. And following something like queen f7, knight g5, and then queen b3, knight a4 is not messing around. Uh, or neither is knight d5. This looks incredibly scary. Neither is even f4, bishop f5 check. I would be very worried about this. Uh, so people are starting to see this, yeah. I think it's very important to play in some combination bishop e2 and rook c1. Now Magnus started with bishop e2. I don't believe there's a big difference. But the real point is that here... We get this setup, and now that once we have played bishop e2 and rook c1, we have stopped black from executing his plans with both queen f7 to b3, because then white is ready with bishop d1, as well as uh, bishop e6 to b3, because then uh, we can go h4, and we no longer have to worry about a move like bishop c2 and queen f7 and something like that. So I think this is a fantastic setup. Now, here... Uh, in my opinion, I at this point, I believe Magnus should have played a3. I think this was the right moment. He probably doesn't even want to take the knight next, but there are circumstances where eventually he would. And in the meantime, he's pointing out that if black were to do something like queen f7, we can go knight g5 and kick this queen away just in time. And as a result here, white should be in very good shape. This queen is going to get kicked all the way back to g8, and I'm no longer particularly concerned of getting mated. So... Uh, so I think Magnus could have gotten away with a3, but instead he played king a1, which also had its logic behind it. Uh, with this, I find it to be a little bit more uh, risky, and I think that black could have taken advantage with it to, uh, to some degree, but still it seems like a pretty good move. So uh, why, did, why did white play king a1? You know, saying f4, bishop f5 tricks. Don't think that's really relevant yet. King a1 is prophylaxis. Yes, but prophylaxis against what exactly?
First of all, what is Black's next move here? That's actually not an easy question to answer. Black's sort of out of moves. C5 and then knight a4, I don't think that's going to work. There's going to be bishop b5. At 65 from Crystal, it may be his best move, but that's a bad sign if Black has to play it. Um, right. So here, Lee Chow felt there was nothing better than Bishop e6. And one nice point of playing Bishop e6 is that after Knight f4, Queen f7 here, we see that there's some difference between the Queen being on f7 and d7. We're actually threatening something right now. This, this pawn on a2 is being encouraged to move. Now, I would very much have preferred something like playing a3, meeting bishop e6 with a knight f4, and then getting a position like this where I can start throwing h4. This, I think, would be a pretty convincing option for white. Um, but uh, the way Magnus played with king a1, bishop e6, knight f4, and queen f7, here we see something very important. What has king a1 done? So Wagner has this right. So Wagner, you want to share with us the big idea? All right, so let's find you and skip on mute. Um, if the king's on b1, then bishop a2 comes with check. Yeah. It's not check anymore. So that means black's attack is one tempo slower. Mm -hmm. At this point, with queen f7 coming, and here the a2 pawn is hit, uh, you could take on e6. That's sort of the only move I would see that would keep you safe. But after something like queen takes back here, I find this unconvincing. Black's going to put a rook on d8 and throw to c5 at you sooner rather than later. I don't really think you have a great plan. People are saying h4, but then some rook to d8. And then, I don't know, I mean, you can play f4, but it's not so clear. But yeah, people are pointing out. By playing king a1, White is a tempo faster when he starts throwing stuff. So H4 comes. And people think of Magnus as some brilliant strategic player as this phenomenal knowledge of the game and intuitive understanding. And all of that is true. Rest assured, when, when he believes an attack is the best way, he does it. So H4 comes, Bishop takes A2, and now H5. And we see that um, Thanks in no small part to King H8, Black is not particularly able to play G5. Some combination of H6, Knight G6, you name it, it's all going to fall apart. Uh, so um, Black plays King G8, H, G, H, G. But is this so clear? Black has a very straightforward plan that will win the game in about four moves. What is Black's plan right now? So Wagner says a4, a3. That's part of it, but I don't think that's actually right. a4, a3. But guys, whenever black was a4, a3, what's what I can respond with? Yeah, sorry, Ian, that is correct. When, we, when black plays a4, a3... Uh, white will play b3 in response. And yes, black is winning some pawns, but I think if we get something like, I don't know, let's just go a, I mean, these are stupid moves, but let's do something like this, a3. Uh, you're winning some pawns, but you're not going to give checkmate here. Um, so the real question is, what is black's plan actually? Austin has this right. You want to share with us? Okay. I've asked you to, I had asked to unmute. Oh, okay. Uh, it wasn't showing up for me. Anyways, um, yeah, so this B3 idea is really annoying. So you can just block it. Like bishop B3, now when the pawn lands on A3, there's just no way to prevent the king from getting opened up. And then from there, white's basically dead because all black pieces are over there. That is absolutely correct. This bishop is also <laughs> hanging on A2, which means that uh, it's nice to get it off of a hanging square. So... If black goes bishop b3, a4, a3, there's a 0% chance our king is going to survive. We need to get to black's king first. There is no time to mess around here. 
All right, what are we going to do with light? Guys, what does this sus word mean? S U S. Is it short for suspicious? Okay. All right. There's no time to mess around. We need to get to Black's King right away. And we need to be calculating very accurately along the way. Oh gosh, guys, come on, stay focused. Don't talk about video games. Okay, so Ariane has an interesting idea. Okay, so Ariane, you want to talk? That's fine. Let's see what you have in mind. Yes, so here are possible ideas to try to bring your queen to the king side through e1 and h4. So maybe queen e1, that's an idea. Sure. So say queen e1. I think bringing the queen to the king side is totally normal. Um, it seems like you're not going to give mate without it. But I'm skeptical of this. Uh, so obviously the point is to go queen h4, queen h7. But how dangerous is that really? Like... Suppose I completely ignore you, which is probably dumb, but let's do something like this. Are you actually going to checkmate me here? Maybe not. I don't think you will. I mean, you can go queen h7 check and whatever, but I don't think it helps that much. Check and here and g 6 and it's still very complicated, but I think you've sort of chased my king exactly where he wants to go. Black is potentially ready for a4, a3 next. Material is still equal. I mean, you sacked the pawn, black sacked the pawn. It's obviously an incredibly complicated position, and it's hard to draw any definite conclusions without thinking a bit more closer than that, but I don't find this wildly convincing. Um, so, what else? Okay, so Sir Ragnar has an idea. Uh, you want to share? I was thinking about e6, and then if bishop takes e6, knight takes, queen takes, and then bishop h6. Yeah, so this I don't like. Um, I think, I mean, I think clearing the f7 score basically means you're never going to give mate. Black probably should somehow defend this, I don't know, bishop f6 or something. But even if black were to completely ignore you and you go bishop g7, I don't believe you will give mate if black's king is allowed to escape via f7 and e8. Uh, the queen on f7 is actually very much in the way. And if you let it get out of the way like this, I think black's chances of survival are pretty high. Like, let's suppose I completely ignore you and keep pushing. You're not going to checkmate me here. I don't think it's even close to checkmate, actually. The king will get away. Instead, let's... could you play like e6, bishop takes, and then queen e1 to h4? Queen e1 here? Um, I think if you wanted to play the queen e1 plan, it might have made more sense to do it before because now black has the f6 score available. Uh, but even this, let's say I go bishop b3, queen h4, and rook d8. Okay, or like this position also, for example, bishop f6 is legal in a way that it wasn't without the pawn. But something like this, I just don't really believe you're going to mate me here. Okay. I mean, this king is leaving the kill zone. So, I don't know. I mean, this is still very complicated, of course, but, um, okay. Um, one big problem that we're facing is that when, I mean, we're sort of playing, obvious, what we're mostly doing here, guys, is playing bug house and getting our queen to h7. That is definitely what we want to do, but at the same time, we also have to realize that uh, it's not necessarily enough to just crash our queen through to h7. Black brings the rook to d8 and runs. So, what we need to do is realize that queen, F, queen h7 is not enough to give mate on its own, and we need to find another way to bring pieces in. So what other pieces would we want to bring into the attack? That's not so easy to see. Can we blow up the position any further? 
People are saying knight h3. That strikes me as incredibly slow. Um, but Sir Vagma has this right. Evan as well. Evan, you want to share with us? Or Daniel? All right, Evan had Evan hasn't said anything yet. Let's get back on him. No, he doesn't want to share. Okay, Daniel, you want to share with us? All right. Let's ask Daniel to share with us. I thought the move was G4 just trying to break open the king side. So G4 does more than just break open the king side. I don't like the word just. I'm not going to get into that lecture right now. We'll find it later. But G4, when we're thinking about what's going on here, this queen needs basically three moves to get to H7. So what we were looking at was queening one to H4 to H7. That's three moves. Uh, but we were also deciding that this isn't necessarily enough to give mate. By playing g4, we're potentially ready for g takes f5 at a moment, which could not only open the position, but introduce that pawn as a pretty valuable attacking piece. The point is now, when we play g4, we have another route. We can go queen h2, queen h7. So here, uh, I think this is strictly faster. So for example, after bishop b3, now all white really has to do to get to this king is move this bishop out of the way. So... Here we see that g4 clears the second rank as well as looks to open some lines. So as people are seeing, bishop d1 comes. Bishop f1 was pretty reasonable as well, but I like bishop d1 more. One nice thing about bishop d1 is it makes it harder for black to a3, play a3 under some circumstances because we can take the bishop. All right, so there followed a4, queen h2, rook fd8. Li Chao is playing this typical, this plan we've seen before, try to get this king out of dodge. White has to be very, very careful here to be able to crash through. Let's And here, Magnus calculated exceptionally well. Let's find the way through. Full variation, please. Don't give me just a move. And keep in mind that um, after next after almost any move you make, Black's probably going to play a three, regardless of what threat you make, unless you're literally threatening checkmate. Rio, give me a real variation. Don't just give me a move. This is not a position where you can look at some. I don't know, some strategic theme and say, oh, I think that's probably the best way for us to handle it because X, Y, Z, no. You need like real one calculation, very direct. This is a position that should be decided. It should be decided probably by checkmate and it should be decided in like the next five moves. We need like a real variation here. I can only calculate three moves ahead max. We all know that's not true. Okay, so Raja, you have a variation you want to discuss? All right, let's call on you. Yeah, my variation was um queen h7, king f8. Uh, knight takes g6, king e8, e6. And like, yeah, um, I, I was first looking at queen take e6, but then, um, like, queen take g7. I thought, and I thought, like, um, it's to, um, like, 95 next move probably is too strong. Yeah, but you, yeah cannot, I, you cannot play a3 either because the bishop takes b3 and e7 is made. But what yeah. if I take with the bishop? Yeah, like here, I was um, not sure, but I was thinking 95. Okay, but Black takes with the bishop, and then you're, you're certainly not going to mate him, and he's up a pawn. Why would he be? Oh, worried? yeah. Yeah, I think, I think this is bad news already. Here, it looks pretty bad for white. So that didn't quite work. Um, Anyone else have a variation they want to go over?
Why do kids play Berlin instead of what? I mean, Sicilia instead of Berlin because kids have not been like infected with the chicken disease the way adults have. Um, okay, so Daniel, you have a, a variation you want to discuss? It looks like you have an interesting one. All right, so let me put on you. We can do something similar to what was said, just queen, H sorry, not just, <laughs> queen h7, king f8, knight g6, king e8, gf5, a3, e6. Hmm. Do I need to play a3 here? Do I have other legal moves? What if I play knight c4 and e6, yeah? Hmm. So if I play a3, e6, if I say take on b2, this feels like it should be mate, but if I take this one and then take this one, that really looks like checkmate. There's some rook a2, knight a4, queen f5, there's a knight c4, that this has to be checkmate. There should be three. There should be three here and then check. Really looks like checkmate to me. Can be one. Yeah, it's definitely not working. Yeah. Um, I don't know. Maybe we could even have done better than that somehow. Um, but it looks pretty bad. So Anish is saying here that we can. Oh, there's Queen H8 here, people are saying. But then what? King D7, and what's the big idea? King D7, and is there some big scary move here? Uh, people are saying Rook A1 in this position is better. Yeah, that might be right. Okay, Knight D3, Knight C4. No, okay, Knight D3 and then Knight B4 certainly looks like a draw if nothing else now. There's this is at least a draw for black. Um, maybe he can do better. Uh, this is a spirited line, but I think we can do better than that. Benjamin Chen is knight b1 in the starting position really stupid? Don't ask questions you don't want to know the answer to. Um, so All right, guys, let's find an actual variation to finish this game off. Magnus found something absolutely out of this world. There's two winning moves, but Magnus found, I think, the um, uh, the more convincing one. Keep in mind, A3 is coming, and it's coming to kill you. Somebody says knight b1, is this such a stupid move or something like that? I don't think it's particularly good, but the point is not dumb. White is looking to stop a3. He has a much more tactical way of solving the problem of a3 coming. Yes, Brian, you want to share with us? No. The first move is like relatively straightforward, but you can't play queen h7 check until you've like seen a follow up. I mean, okay, Austin, you have a variation we want to discuss? What's your line? Uh, I played g takes f5 first, but I think it transposes after queen, a queen h7 anyway. So uh, I don't think Black is going to waste time taking the f5 pawn. He's probably going to go ahead and start attacking you with a3. Okay, so say you want g takes f5 on the first move? Here? Yeah. Let's say I'm going to I give you the check on h7. Mm -hmm. and, now? and then e6. And then a3, aren't you mated? 
Wait, no, we have to take on g6 first and then play e6 so that taking the queen's check. Okay, and I throw the horse. Well, wait, not e6. Uh, you have to take on f7. Sure. And then I believe the move here was like knight e5. You're relying too much on memory. It just doesn't work here. Uh, I mean, that's how the game went, but it's not that this line here does not work. If you try to remember, if you try to rely on memory, uh, it's not going to help you. Um, Magnus found a very similar variation where 95 here did work, but here I don't believe it does. And I hear I think you made it. People are suggesting we make a knight. I didn't even know how to make. Okay, imagine that's a knight and we go king f8 or king c8. How did that help us? On oh, 97. Okay. So here we would have to have gone. It's kind of annoying that I can't make it a knight. Does anybody know like the keyboard control thing to make it a knight? It's alt. No, that didn't help. All right. Um, So if we make an, imagine this is a knight and then it's here and it's knight e7 and king b8, what happens next? Knight d7 maybe? Maybe this works. Um, I know uh, g takes f5 does win, so maybe this was possible. Um, but uh, there's another winning move that I that Magnus played that I think is more convincing and nicer. Uh, that variation, if you have to go f8 knight, is kind of convoluted. I don't know it off the top of my head, but um, keep in mind, guys, a3 is coming. What we would really like to do is stop Black from playing a3. And one of the what's the biggest reason that a3 is a threat? It's not so much that the a3 square is not under control. It's rather that what is this pawn a4 doing right now that's so important? The pawn on a4 is serving a very important purpose that it will not be doing once it gets to a3. And it highly, yeah, so everyone's saying guarding the bishop. This is right. This is why Magnus put the bishop on d1. So the point, as a couple people pointed out, is to start with queen h7 check and now play d5, cutting off black's queen from the defense of this bishop so that a3 is well met with bishop takes b3. Now moves like knight e6 are not messing around. So Li Chao went for knight c4. Uh, now a3 is coming, and uh, it's checkmate, next move. We need to be very direct and very violent to calculate this, um, this out. So there's only one way through, but it does work. Let's find it. And then that'll be the end for this game. Full variation, please. Evan, I don't think that's very convincing. So Rod, yeah, it's sort of right-ish, but what's Evan's line? Okay, no, I don't. Okay, so Austin's got this. You want to share with us, Austin, because we're running a little short on time now? All right, so let's ask on you. Uh, so my line was my g 6 check, once again, important that you can take. Okay, did you consider check. queen g6? Uh, queen g6 uh, after queen. You should be thinking about this before giving a line. Oh, wait, queen g6, uh, a3, rook h8 check, bishop h8, and then bishop. Just in time, rook h8 is checkmate. Just in time. So, uh, knight takes g6, check king e8, and now? e6. So, if this queen comes back to f6, we have check, and then rook h8, and this is made just in time once more. Black just made it here. Uh, so, black has to 
has to go forwards with a3. And then, and then we take. And then here, the important difference is I knight f5 works because we can take that five pawn with the queen. Yes, we don't if we have to our pawn to this square. And this is the big point is here we go, queen takes f5 check, and then uh, after king c7, there is queen takes e5 check, which distracts this knight on c4 from the b2 pawn, which means for one move and one move only, this is not actually checkmate. White goes ahead and grabs this bishop on b3, and he has transitioned into a winning endgame. Uh, the game concluded with a b2, king b2, check, knight c1, and after king c8 and here f4, Li Chao called it quits. Um, so honestly, I don't think Magnus is much of an attacking player in general. It's probably one of the weaker elements of his game overall. And this is what he produces if this is like sort of the weak part of his game, so to speak. I mean, this was just such a brilliant game. Like, he found everything. He knew exactly how to play prophylactically. He was looking at... Um, he understood even before... Queen, I mean, Queen E8 was a novelty as Lee Chow played uh, back in this position. Queen E8 was a novelty. He probably didn't know much about the move at, at first glance. He figured out to come up with this plan of Rook C1 and Bishop around to D1. Now, I think he could have made an improvement by playing A3, but he did a very good job of playing prophylactically against Black's best option. Then when it came down to it and he decided it was time to go for a race, he did not shy away. He went straight for the race. He conducted it perfectly, found the D5 move, calculated it straight through to the end, and then won. I mean, this is this is just an unbelievable game to me. It's, it strikes me as completely out of this world, and that's the kind of game that makes Magnus the player that he is. I, I can't imagine him ever playing a game of this quality and anybody ever scoring half a point. It's, it's baffling. Now, of course, he can't play this well every game. Nobody can, but it says a lot. Uh, the last thing I want to say before I, um, I call it quits on this one is if we look, Queen E8, as I mentioned at the time, was a novelty. And we saw the effectiveness of what uh, Magnus managed to do against it. Now, Queen E8 has since been played. And let's see how another white player handled the position and who you think was able to put more pressure upon it. So let me, let me actually switch the tab here. Um, to this game. All right. In this position here, Queen E8 was played. Alpha Zero did not find this plan. Alpha Zero plays like, I don't know, it found King B1, Rook C1, and then here it went G3 instead of Bishop E2. When I think Bishop E2 was far and away a better move, more, more natural to me. After Bishop E6, White was unable to, um, to put the knight on F4 because of, uh, because of queen f7, so alpha zero went for knight g5, and they got a position like this one. Here, this knight really belongs on f4. It's just a better square for the knight. Uh, alpha zero took this and ended up in some pretty mundane position like this. After a whole lot of maneuvering where absolutely nothing happened, eventually the game was drawn. I think at some point something happened. Um, really not wildly exciting. I guess here d5 was played, but... Um, Anyhow, in a higher chess sense, who knows? Maybe maybe the AI machine was right and Magnus was wrong. When you look at this game and you look at this position, you develop your understanding of what is, who do you think played the better game? It just says, well, I mean, it strikes me as, and this was long before the AI engines were even invented. It was, Magnus could not have learned from this. It was like... Um, so, uh, yeah, that's basically what I have to say about this game. We've got five more minutes left. I'd like to open it up for a general Q&A. Uh, any questions you guys may have? What do I think about super GMs who play bad openings? It almost feels unfair uh, that... Guys can be lazy and not do their homework and still be amazing chess players, but life isn't fair. Never has been, never will be. And you just have to uh, work harder than them, take their pieces, and hopefully beat them. Uh, in general, though, I don't think any real super GMs play bad openings in classical games. They only do it online. What do I think is the worst opening? Um, any opening named after an animal is going to be terrible. Um, all right. If, 
Okay, guys, if anybody ever mentions that topic again, I'm literally just kicking you out of the meeting. You know who you are. You know what you did. Um, other questions? When do you suggest the use of engine when analyzing your own game? That's a good one. I think what you should do is put your own game into chess space, copy it in as the game was played, uh, put in the things that you saw during the game, the lines you calculated, the things, various evaluations you made, check with the computer afterwards and make notes of which spots you were correct in and which spots you were wrong. And this will give you some sense of where you were calculating well and, um, and where you were evaluating well and vice versa, where you mis may have misevaluated a position, for example. Um, uh, so, um, Other questions? Do I use Leela for novelties? In general, I prefer to use Stockfish, mainly just because it works faster, but I usually run Leela on a lot of the positions I get. And if I don't understand a position and Leela and Stockfish disagree, I'll just make them play against each other until I do understand it. I think that's uh, pretty normal. Do you use chess space? Uh, yeah, chess space is so much better than the chess analysis board. It's the tool that any serious chess player should be using. Um, it's uh, it's a very valuable tool. So if you have a bad position versus a lower rated player and they offer a draw, should you take it? I don't really know. I can't remember the last time that ever happened to me. For me, a lower rated player is still like a pretty strong GM at like 2650 or whatever. I mean, these people did not get to where they are by offering draws when they are better. Um, do I practice blindfold? Not wildly often. I had trouble with the blindfold banter blitz. It's It was tough to play blitz and talk about it and be blindfolded at the same time. But I got, I got the hang of it after a few games, but it was still difficult. Is blitz good? Um, blitz is definitely useful, but you have to use it right. You certainly don't want to play blitz at the expense of classical chess. You don't want to develop bad habits. You don't want to let your time management habits or thinking processes in blitz uh, start to become present in your classical play. Um, but it can definitely train you to have good instincts and see tactics quickly and stuff like that. Petrov Berlin and Queen D8 Scandi repertoire is good, right? That's not really a repertoire. Those are three different defenses against E4. The Petrov and Berlin are both pretty dry and nitty gritty and boring with their absolute first rate opening. Scandinavian is just not good. Um, Jakob and John basically refuted it in their book like five years ago and nobody has changed my opinion since then. Um, I've played that refutation twice and uh, won both games pretty easily. Uh, I'll take like one more question after. Okay, here's a good one. After, can I give us the name of that game with the refutation? It was not like, I mean, it's it was my game with Gorovets, but it doesn't really work because he didn't play a very challenging way. Like, black, he could have made me work much harder to show a big advantage, but he didn't. I got there pretty quickly. Um, okay, after the opening, how do you determine how much time to spend on moves? Um, you need to evaluate how complicated the position is, uh, how if you were to spend a lot of time and find the best move versus playing the second best move right now, how much better do you think the best move is than the second best move? You also have to evaluate how much longer you think this game is going to last. For example, this one we were just looking at at the moment when White played G4 and both kings are about to get throttled. You can't really imagine this game is going to last 10 more moves, or at least not seriously last 10 more moves you probably should be burning a lot of time there in a more closed position in a game that could easily go to move 60 or 80 or 200 or whatever. You probably are going to want to be moving a bit faster because you'll need the time later. Um, anyhow, yeah, so that's, I think that'll do it. Um, good job today, guys. Uh, this is one of my favorite Magnus games and I hope you guys enjoyed it too. And I hope I was able to shine some light on it, even for those who had already seen it and studied it before. Stop.